do believe I am live on Facebook. Let me get my Insta going right quick. Because I like to come on just a little bit early because I know that if I come on late, y'all think that means that I'm not coming. And that's not the truth. All right, just getting Insta going. There's my sister. Hey, sis. All right. Okay, of course, Insta is acting crazy. I don't know why my Instagram is acting crazy. Check my connection. Technology is really funny, isn't it? Because when it, it works, it's great. When it works, it's all good. But when it doesn't, then it's about to get on your nerves. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Okay, it's, it's working now. Okay, and it's two thirty. Perfect. So let's get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, thanking you for this day, thanking you for your kindness, thanking you for your mighty word, oh God. Thank you for another chance to hear from you, oh God. And so uh, I must decrease, so you must increase, oh God. So please, I die to myself right now. Please forgive me, oh God, wash me clean and fill me with the Holy Ghost as never before and speak through me, oh God, breathe through me. Let the words spoken be the words that you want spoken, that you might be glorified, the saints might be edified, that the demons would be terrified and sinners would be mortified to live one more day without you. And let signs and wonders and miracles follow this very prophetic word, oh God, that you want to release on this Sunday. We thank you for it, we believe you for it, and we're expecting you to do great and miraculous, mighty things, things that only you can do, because we believe you, and according to our faith, so it is unto us. We thank you for it, and I declare, decree, pray, and believe it, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Today's live prophetic word is leveling up. Today's live prophetic word is leveling up. Up, put that on the screen. It's leveling up. There can come a moment. Notice I said can. And the reason I said can is because it doesn't happen for everybody. There can come a moment where everything changes. Now, again, the reason I said can, that there can come a moment, is because some people aren't going to get it. <clears throat> so, May 16th, 1983, what happened? How many of you know what I'm talking about happened on May 16th, 1983? On May 16th, 1983, that's when Motown 25 aired. And when Motown 25 aired, a lot of the former Motown artists came back to celebrate 25 years of Motown. And among them, uh, of course, was the Jackson Five, which obviously included Michael Jackson. So depending on who tells the story, the story is a little different depending on who's telling it. But long story short, that night uh, that they taped Motown 25, Michael Jackson did <clears throat> his rendition of Billie Jean. 
Now, you may or may not know that Michael was lip syncing to the original track because they didn't really trust the band to get the groove right. <laughs> so Michael said, and whoever else said, that they're just going to go ahead on and let Michael lip sync to his original track, the track that we heard when the song was first released. So Michael did Billie Jean that night, and he did it as a solo performance because he did kind of a medley of the Jackson 5 songs with his brothers. And then he said he really liked the old songs, but he was really excited about the new songs. And he grabbed the mic, and that beat started, and Michael launched into Billie Jean. And he did that song, and he worked that song. And then Michael did the moonwalk. He's not the first performer to do the moonwalk or the backwards slide or the backwards cakewalk, whatever you want to call it. But Michael certainly has immortalized it. And Michael, it certainly has become a part of Michael's signature moves. And when you think of the moonwalk, you think of him before you think of anybody else. And in that moment, Michael Jackson went from being a star to a superstar. <laughs> he went from being a star to a superstar. Some say he went from being a superstar to a megastar. But the point I'm trying to make is that was Michael's moment. That's the moment that changed everything in his life. That's the moment when Michael Jackson leveled up and he never looked back. Nothing was ever the same for him after that moment when he did Billie Jean and his whole life changed. What's that got to do with us, Prophet Taylor? What's that got to do with the prophetic word? What's that got to do with the Bible? I'm glad you asked. I'm fixing to show you, or I'm fin to show you, all right? <clears throat> Our scripture today is going to come out of 1 Kings 3. Put that on the screen. 1 Kings 3. And I'm going to read from that right now. 1 Kings 3. I'm reading out of the New International Version. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. Now, 1 Kings, as you know, is the Old Testament. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Okay, so I'm reading out of 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, out of the NIV, the New International Version. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, 
nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Lord have mercy. So what did we just read? We just read that Solomon as a kid had made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he married the daughter of Pharaoh. He brought her to the city of David, the city of David uh, that his father uh, had built. And Solomon was still building his own palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. So he had three major real estate projects going at the same time. The people were still sacrificing in high places because they didn't have a temple to come in and sacrifice to the Lord. And Solomon was still doing that too. Now I want you to notice when the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. That's significant. I'm going to come back to that later. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and God gave Solomon a blank check. What would you do if God Almighty showed up in your dream, in your bedchamber, and said to you, tell me what you want me to do for you. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll bless you in any way you want to be blessed. What would you say? Have you ever thought about that? What would you say to God Almighty who offered you a blank check and said, I will do whatever you want. Okay. So what Solomon did with that precipitous moment was to say to God Almighty to remember. Now, remember last week I talked about King Belshazzar who did not remember the lessons of his father, King Nebuchadnezzar. This week I'm talking about King Solomon who even as a kid remembered what God did for his father, David. He said, you've shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David. He was faithful to you. Continue this kindness by granting him a son to sit on the throne. You've made me king in my father's place. But he said, I'm just a kid and I don't know how to carry out my duties. And uh, I'm uh, here among this huge nation of people, too many people to count. So give me a discerning heart to govern the people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. Wow, so God offered Solomon anything he wanted and Solomon said to God, give me some sense. <laughs> if, <laughs> if God says he'll do for you whatever you want and your response is to ask for some sense, that means you already got some sense. And that's because David and Bathsheba, yes, that Bathsheba, Bathsheba is Solomon's mother. David and Bathsheba, and Solomon talks about it in the first five chapters of Proverbs, took the time to pour into that boy. They took the time to teach him about life and teach him about wisdom and teach him about how to act. That's called home training. Verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for this. And so God said to him, since you asked that and you didn't ask for long life and you didn't ask for money and you didn't ask me to kill your enemies, but you asked for discernment, wisdom and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart. Look at that. God put it right in him. But God said so that there will have never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, 
so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Now, in that moment, that was Solomon's Michael Jackson, Billie Jean moment. What would you do if you had a national platform and a national stage and they wanted you to do a new song? If you're going to separate yourself from your brothers, if you're no longer little Michael Jackson from the Jackson 5, you've got to get out there and you've got to crush it. That's what. you got to kill it. And Michael did. Well, God Almighty leveled up this little kid who said, give me some sense so I can rule the people well. And God said, not only will I give you sense, I will give you so much sense until you are gonna be in a class by yourself. Do you know how many people achieve class by themselves status? Do you know how hard that is to do on a planet of seven and a half billion? But we do know some people that have done it. Michael Jordan did it, Simone Biles did it, Simone Biles still doing it. Class by themselves. That means there is literally no one else on your level and literally no one else that's even a peer. God Almighty gave that little boy the distinction of so much wisdom and so much discernment until the Lord said, there's never going to be, have been in the past, a king like you, and there never will ever be again a king like you. God gave Solomon class by himself status because he gave him so much wisdom. Then God wasn't done. He said, I'll give you money. I'll give you wealth. He didn't just say money. He didn't just say cash. He said wealth because there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy because wealth is generational. <laughs> And you can't get rid of wealth except by, you know, if there's like a national collapse. If the nation collapses, then your wealth will be gone. But once you get into a wealthy place, you can't spend, you won't, you couldn't live 10 generations long enough to spend wealth once you get wealth. Wealth and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. So once again, God gave King Solomon so much money. And he gave him so much honor until once again, he put him in a class by himself. God Almighty leveled that little boy up. And then God wasn't done. He said, if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David, your father did, I will give you a long life. Now, that's a very interesting statement. Because we know that King David had flesh out of control. We know that King David... Uh, saw Bathsheba, which was Uriah's wife. She was bathing on the roof. He asked his boys, who is that? And they said, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And King David was like, go get her. And so they went and got her and he slept with her. And Bathsheba doesn't say anything in the story until she sends word, word back to the king and says, I'm pregnant. So then David tried to bring Uriah off the battlefield home to sleep with Bathsheba to make it look like the baby was Uriah's, but Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife because he said, I don't have any right to be having pleasure at home with my wife while my brethren on the battlefield. So then David basically put out a hit on Uriah, but he wanted to make it look like an accident. So he told them to put Uriah in the heat of the battle where they were shooting down arrows at him from the wall of the enemy and back away from him and his company. So they all ended up dying. So after that happened, they had a funeral and then David took Bathsheba and brought her in the palace and she had a baby. Then God came and judged him and a whole bunch of stuff God brought down on King David for that foolishness. So it's very interesting. Like he said, the child was going to die. He, the sword was never going to leave his house. Like he was going to raise up trouble out of his own house. David reaped a lot of negative consequences and he should have died and he knew he should have died for that too. But God said that he would have mercy and put away his sin. He wasn't going to die, but all these consequences were going to come. Yet, after David is dead, God says, if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David, your father did, I would give you a long life. You know what that means? That means that God remembered all the stuff that David did right. 
And he remembered that in his account because Solomon is the son of Bathsheba. Solomon is the son of a woman that King David didn't have no business with. A woman he stole from another man, from a soldier in his army. He took that man's wife. That's Solomon's mama, if you didn't know that. So we people always talk about King David committed adultery. He did, but they forget that that same woman is King Solomon's mama. So I find it very interesting that God remembered the stuff that David did right in his life. Good God almighty. We know it's not that way with people. <laughs> You know that if people get a hold of anything wrong that you've done, as far as they're concerned, you become that. Like no matter what else you did, all they're ever going to fixate on is the wrong stuff. But I noticed that God is not like that. I noticed that all the stuff that King David did that was right in the eyes of the Lord. When speaking of him, God remembers that stuff when speaking to his son. So in that moment, King Solomon got a level up. He went from being a boy king to the most distinguished king in wisdom, honor, and wealth in the history of Israel. There was never a king before Solomon like him, although there had only been two. And there was never a king after Solomon, after all the many kings that came, and even when Israel and Judah were split, which ironically happened because of Solomon, but that's another story. Solomon didn't have a peer. God put him in a class by himself. What would you do if God offered you that? What would you do if you had a dream tonight and God said, I'll do whatever you want? What would you do if God gave you a level up like that. Why is this significant? I'm about to tell you why. Because the Holy Ghost is trying to let us know that for some, an opportunity for a level up is coming. And just like Michael Jackson got his opportunity on Motown 25, May 16th, 1983, when the world saw what he could do as a solo artist, just like King Solomon got to level up because God Almighty, the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the great king, the great God, came to him in a dream and wrote him a blank check. Solomon had one time to answer God. And if you notice in the text, Solomon didn't hesitate. He said, give me some sense. He said, you've been good to my father. And you've extended that goodness to my father because you made me his son king in his place. Now I'm just a kid and I don't know how to perform my royal duties. So give me some sense so I can administer justice and judgment to this great people you put me in charge of. And God was so pleased with what he heard Solomon say. He gave him that kind of level up. Now, why do I keep stressing that that this moment can come, but this moment is not going to come for everyone. I'll tell you why. Here's why. Here it comes. Some people miss their moment to level up because, number one, they are holding on to past pain. What do I mean by that? They are still obsessing over all that they've been through. And every time they open their mouths to speak, all they talk about is all that they've been through and how they did me wrong. And this happened to me when I was a kid and this wasn't right and that wasn't right and blah, 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 blah. I know someone that lived and died like that. I know someone who with every ounce of pain that they've been through, every little single thing they've been through, they held on to it. And every time, if you talk to them over, over five minutes, they would bring up, <laughs> they would bring up the litany of pain and wrongs 
and perceived wrongs, because remember, some wrongs are actual wrongs and some wrongs are perceived wrongs, meaning it wasn't really a wrong. You just see it that way. But either way, this person that I'm thinking of held on to every ounce of pain they ever experienced in their lives. See, because some people, their focus is so busy in the past, busy in the rearview mirror, they can't see what's on the road ahead of them. That's why Paul said in Philippians 3.13 that we don't count ourselves to have attained. We don't count ourselves to have apprehended. In other words, I'm not perfect. I'm still striving. Uh, I haven't yet achieved and accomplished all that God wants me to do or be. But Paul said, I tell you this, I tell you one thing in verse 14. Uh, uh, well, verse 14 is about pressing towards the mark, but he says, verse 13, I forget those things which are behind. Because remember that Apostle Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus and he was a Christian killer. He killed Christians professionally. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and the new religion of Christianity that was new in his day was perceived as a threat. So then Saul of Tarsus got the legal right to arrest and execute Christians. That's who this man was. And this man said, I forget those things which are behind. And I reach forth into, to, into those things which are before. Okay? So some people are going to miss their level up moment because they're so busy holding on to the pain of the past. Maybe the things that they did wrong and maybe the things that were done wrong to them. And if you do that, that can cause you to miss your moment. Number two, second reason some people miss is because they have low or no expectations. What do I mean by that? I mean that the way life works is that you get what you expect. And so if you set a goal and you have a desired result and you work toward it, you can't just do the work on the outside. It's because you have hope and faith on the inside. Is because you expect, I remember when Sean Johnston won her medals in the Olympics, they were interviewing her and they said, how do you feel? How does it feel to win those medals? How does it feel to be one of the best in the world in gymnastics? And Sean, she just kind of sighed. She said, huh, it was expected, <laughs> which always struck me as really, really funny because basically she said, I've been working all my life trying to become an Olympian. I've been working in doing everything I knew how to do to master my sport. In other words, she's saying, I didn't come out here not to win. <laughs> I didn't come out here not to medal. She said, I've been expecting to win. I've been working on winning. I've been pushing myself so that I could win because she expected to win. But see, some people, they have low or no expectations. They don't believe, they don't expect to win and life will give you what you expect. And some people just can't find the hope or the faith in their hearts to create an expectation that life can be better or different or higher than it is right now. Number three, some people don't uh, catch their level up moment because they have low self-esteem. They don't think they're worthy they don't think they're worthy. I stop by to tell you, there's no human on this planet that has ever walked this planet, including the first two humans that have been without sin, except Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus was God as a man. So the only human that's ever lived and died and resurrected and had a life on this planet with no sin in it has been the son of God himself. Every other one of us from Adam and Eve on down <clears throat> have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But some people have such low self-esteem, they don't seem to realize that whoever it is that you look up to, they don't have any more than you in terms of they got two eyes, they got two ears, they got two hands, they got two feet, they got the same structure as you. Some people don't even have that. Some people have accomplished a lot and haven't even had all of their limbs and appendages. Okay, but the point I'm trying to make is that gravity 
fastens their feet to the ground, just like you. They breathe oxygen, just like you. If they get cut, they bleed red, just like you. They have to sleep at some point, just like you. So in other words, they're in the same boat you're in. They're not without sin. They're not perfect people. They have the same body design structure and they're, they have the same rules, the same conditions. But some people, their self-esteem is so low, they don't think they're worthy. Why is someone else more worthy than you? Well, Prophet Taylor, you don't understand because I did some stuff that was wrong. Well, welcome to the human race. Welcome to planet Earth. You find me that person that's never made a mistake and his name is not Jesus Christ. But because of their low self-esteem, because they're so busy beating up on themselves, because they're so busy putting themselves down, because they're so busy not recognizing what God has put in their hands. They miss their moment to level up. Number four, some people miss their moment to level up because they have a fear of being successful. I know you don't think that's real, but that's real. Some people are afraid of success. And I think that that one is tied into having a low self-esteem, maybe feeling like you don't deserve it or you can't handle it, but you're no different from anybody else. Why do they get to have success and you can't? In Numbers 13, that tells a story. You've heard me refer to this many times about how the children of Israel that left Egypt under Moses in the great Exodus, came to the edge of the promised land and sent spies to spy out the land. As a matter of fact, I wanna read some of that to you. Numbers 13, 26. They came back, they meaning the spies, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, or Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Those were giants, those were descendants of Nephilim human angel hybrids. The Amalekites live in the, in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. In the King James, King James, it says, we are well able to overcome it and possess it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the, the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. See, that's low self-esteem and fear of success. So in other words, they never transitioned from being slaves to being landowners. They never transitioned from thinking like slaves would, because when you think like a slave, you are property. You're not a person, you're property. And you get told what to do and you get beat in the morning and you get beat in the noonday and you get beat at night. And when you have kids, they sell off your family. They break up your family and sell off your children and feed you whatever kind of garbage they want to feed you. And you have no control over your life and you just exist to do hard labor for whoever owns you. That's slavery. Well, these people, after seeing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, literally from the very hand of God, these people got to the edge of the promised land and said, we can't do it because there's some giants there and, and we look like grasshoppers to them and blah, 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 blah. 
You know why? Part of it was low self-esteem, but part of it is because they were afraid of being successful. So you have to transition from being a slave in your head to understand that you can be a landowner, that you can be a land possessor, that you can be a giant slayer, that you can eat from the best in life. They said that the land was flowing with milk and honey. You understand what that means? Milk always represents nourishment and honey always represents sweetness. So in other words, God was saying, I'm trying to move you to a place where I will not only nourish you, but where life will be sweet. And they said, we can't do it. Even though the God of heaven was with them, and even though the God of heaven had proven himself over and over and over, they spoiled the Egyptians when they left. They took all that money. When Pharaoh came after them, God put a pillar of fire in front of Pharaoh to stop him. And then God parted the Red Sea. And then they walked over on dry land. And then God made the sea come back down on Pharaoh. And then when they were in the wilderness, God made manna rain down from heaven. And then Moses spoke to the rock and water came out of a rock. And then they say, they said, we wanted meat. We tired all this bread. So God sent a wind and sent quail from the sea. God hand delivered them people and God hand fed them people and God hand destroyed their enemies. And they got to the edge of the promised land and said, we can't do it. Lord have mercy. Those are people that are afraid of being successful. A fear of success is a real thing. I'm telling you, it's a real thing in here and in here. And if you don't learn how to embrace the fact that God wants to take you to a place where not only do you get nourishment, that's the milk, but you get honey where life can actually be sweet, where you're not struggling, where you're not struggling every day, where you're not struggling all the time, where life is sweet, where you're enjoying the good of the land. That is where God wants to take all that believe. But just like that first generation that came out of Israel, everybody doesn't make it because some people are afraid of being successful. Okay. This is what I mean when I say that even if a level up moment is coming, some people are going to miss it. Hold on. Just hold the ghost. Just give me some. Okay. 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 For behold, my people, the day is coming and yea, now is where I do reach out my hands and I do offer a blessing. I do offer a level up. I do offer your heart's desire. I do offer whatever you want. Tell me your heart. Tell me your desire. And just like King Solomon, if I'm pleased with what you ask, I will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. For I am a good God. I did not mean for you to live a miserable life. I did not mean for you to live a defeated life. I did not mean for you to stay under bondage all of your days. I did not mean for you to struggle in the wilderness. But yea, rather, I want to bring you into a land that's flowing with nourishment, that's flowing with sweetness, that's flowing with all that you need, where you can own the land, where you can own the real estate, where you can defeat your enemies, where you can slay the giants, where you can possess that which I, that which I have promised you. Behold, my hand is open and it's not going to stay open forever. So now is the time for you to choose to believe me and enter into my rest, enter into your promised land, enter into a place where your life flows with milk and honey and enter into a place where I can level you all the way up, says the spirit of the living God. Wow, just wow. Now, one more thing I want to say, and that is that one of the things that is often <clears throat> ignored minimized or just outright ignored in this exchange with God and Solomon is how much King David did to set this up. 
I need you to understand that it's not just for no reason that God made this offer to Solomon. So I'm going to read something for you to help you understand how there is actually a flow of blessing. That's why Solomon acknowledged it, because even as a child, he got it. There is actually a flow of blessing from David to Solomon because of David's sacrifice, because of David's fundraising efforts, because of all that David did to set up the building of the temple. So let me read that for you in First Chronicles. I'm reading out of First Chronicles 29 in the New International Version. Then King David said to the whole assembly, my son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen. I'm starting in verse one. Then King David said to the whole assembly, my son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. All of these in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple, 3,000 talents of gold, gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls and of the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand, that David made a huge sacrifice. King David made a huge offering before the Lord for the work of his temple. So God coming to Solomon like this didn't come out of nowhere. Why am I bringing that up? Because some people, you've heard me talk about it before, some people despise their godly Heritage. They don't understand that their parents and their grandparents and maybe their great grandparents, somebody in your family walked before the Lord to the point where God was exceedingly pleased with the way that they lived. And because he was, he offers a next level <laughs> generational blessing to the next generation. So that's why I wanted to read First Chronicles 29 to you so that you could see that King David set that up. King David made that sacrifice. King David contributed all that money, all that gold, all that silver, the bronze, the marble, the onyx, the turquoise. But after his fundraising, King David said, now I'm going to turn over my personal treasures of gold and silver. Did you see that part? So in other words, King David opened up everything he had because he loved the Lord so, and he wanted this temple to be built so until he sacrificed all the money he had. So the first part is talking about the resources he raised, but then he talked about the sacrifice he made to give his own personal stores to the building of the house of the Lord. Do you understand what just happened? So if you are the descendant of someone that loved the Lord and sacrificed their life to please Christ, that means that you can get an offer. Notice I said can, because Esau got that offer and Esau spit it away. So it fell to Jacob. Don't get me started on that story. You can get an offer from God to level you up all the way up. You see that? Do you see the blessedness of that? So what's the point of today's prophetic word? The point of today's prophetic word is that if God comes to you and extends his hand and says, I'll give you whatever you want. If God comes to you because you come from a godly family, if God comes to you 
because someone before you has sacrificed and sacrificed in such a way that's pleasing to the Lord. And God opens his hand and offers you a level up. I stopped by to tell you today, don't miss it. Don't miss your chance to level up. Don't miss your Michael Jackson, Billy Jean moment. Don't miss your King Solomon. I'll give you whatever you want. God Almighty wrote you a blank check moment. Don't miss it. Don't miss your level up moment because it's not going to come for everybody. Everybody in this life does not get a chance to level up. Some people work and work and work and work and work and struggle and struggle and struggle. And that's their whole life. They live and die in obscurity. They live and die and they never break through. They live and die and they never achieve the level of goals that they wanted to achieve. So that's what I mean when I say that opportunity, that level up, that moment does not come for everyone. But if it does come for you, then let me review the traps we need to avoid. Number one, you need to be sure that you have let go of your past pain, that it's not dominating your life. Of course, you can still remember stuff when you think about it, but it's not dominating your life. It's not informing your actions now. You're not doing what you're doing. See, here's a way to know that you're healed. There's two uh, measures you can use. One measure to know if you're healed is if you can laugh about it, if you can look back on the past and laugh at some stuff, that's how you know you're healed, number one. Number two, another way you know you're healed is when you are not doing anything as a direct reaction to something that's already happened. Where you're doing what you're doing because you're enjoying your life, because you're living in the moment, because you have an eye towards the future, because you're building towards something greater. That's how you know you're not bound by your past, them two tests. Can you look back at some stuff and laugh? Is it funny to you now? And are you doing what you're doing as a reaction to what's going on before? Or are you building something new and unique? Okay. So we don't want to make the mistake of holding on to past pain. Number two, we don't want to make the mistake of having a low expectation. Because if you have a low expectation of life, that's what life is going to serve you up. Low expectations. If you only think low and you believe low and you see low and you expect low, then for sure, life is going to give you exactly what you expected. Number three, low self-esteem, where for some reason you don't like yourself or you don't believe you're worthy or you think because you've made mistakes, everybody except God makes mistakes or you think because of your sins, everybody except God has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So in other words, the people that are successful is not that they haven't been sinners in their life. If God blessed them, why wouldn't he bless you? And finally, fear of success itself, transitioning from being a slave up here to being a land owner, a land possessor, a giant killer, someone who can overcome their enemies and someone who can come into a land in other words, it's not just temporary, it's not just sometimey, it's you live in a space where there's plenty of milk, which represents nourishment, and there's plenty of honey, which represents sweetness. You're nourished and life is sweet. Don't miss that moment. Because for some, it's not going to come at all. And for most people, it's never going to come again never going to come again. So I want you to understand that if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, and if the Spirit of God is giving you a witness as I'm talking, that he's talking to you, he's talking about you, he's saying that this is for you, then reach up, my brothers and my sisters, and grab it. Reach up, my brothers and my sisters, and take it. And don't miss your level up moments. And the last thing I want to say, hey, there's Hasia, my cousin. How you doing, Hasia? On Instagram. Good to see you. And the last thing I want to say uh, before I wrap this up is 
this right here. Don't let anyone talk you out of it. Because many times in life now, now, let me just say, in addition to this, there's some words in the English language that we abuse. And there's some words in the English language that we use too much and we use inappropriately and out of context. One of them words is love. Because in English, we have one word love that means all different kinds of love. In Greek, they have many different words for love. Because, you know, loving your cat is not the same as loving your car. It's not the same as loving your mom. It's not the same as loving your job. It's not the same as loving some pizza, which I do. And not the same as loving your kids, which I do. They make the, all, all the same kinds of love. But what I'm trying to get at is here's the word that we abuse the most in the English, English language, as far as I'm concerned. And that word is friend. <laughs> My friends. See, because... There are some gospel lyrics that are black people gospel lyrics. Food on my table, but I know God is able. Don't nobody sing that but black people. Other cultures don't sing about provision like we do. Woke me up this morning, started me on my way. That's a black people gospel lyric. Okay. And so one of the black people gospel lyrics that we sing all the time is my friends talked about me. Now, ever since I was a child, I've been a little bit confused about that line because if they your friends, <laughs> why are they talking about you? See, I don't understand that. I never have understood that. I don't, I don't understand that line. So I'm bringing that up in this context to say this to you, that when God Almighty opens his hand and gives you a chance to go to the next level, or to go all the way to the top like he did King Solomon and put you in a class by yourself. Don't let anybody talk you out of that, especially not, quote unquote, so-called friends. Because if somebody <clears throat> is actually your friend, they would be happy for you to get a chance to level up. If you get a chance to level up and they're jealous and angry and they try to talk you out of it, and they try to hold you back from it, that is not them, there's nothing about that that is your friend. Then people at best are frenemies. At best, they're just friendly enemies. They're people that are in your life that are trying to hold you at a certain level, that are trying to stop you from moving forward with Christ. Them people are not friends. How do you know the difference? I'll tell you how you know. It's a difference between Judas and Peter and James and John. The reason that the Lord was so close to Peter and James and John is because they supported Jesus no matter what. When the Lord's preaching and teaching, when he's feeding 4,000 men plus women and children, 5,000 men plus women and children, when the Lord's doing whatever he's doing, they supported his program. That ain't what Judas did. If you've ever uh, wondered why did Judas betray the Lord, Judas betrayed the Lord because the Lord wasn't doing what Judas wanted him to do. They thought that Jesus was going to be a little revolutionary and start uh, a stage an insurrection and stage a coup where the, the Hebrews that were under the governing power of the Romans were actually going to overthrow the Romans and take over the land and put Israel back on top. And that's why most of the men that followed Jesus followed him for that reason. That's why I remember when they came to arrest Jesus, people always say, all his friends left him. That's not what happened. They fought. We, re we really need to try reading the Bible, <laughs> reading the scripture, what it actually says. When they came to arrest Jesus, Peter took out his sword and cut off that man's ear. That's not somebody that's running. They fought. Do you understand? They fought because they thought this is it. This is what they've been waiting on the Lord to do. But Jesus wasn't moving fast enough for Judas. Okay? He wasn't doing it the way Judas thought he should do it. That's why Judas sold him out to, you know, from the Pharisees and the religious leaders to the Roman government. Okay? So anybody that's willing to sell you out, that's what I'm trying to tell you, how you discern the difference. Anybody that's willing to sell you out because you're not being who they want you to be because you're not doing what they want you to do, 
because you're not going fast enough, because whatever, that is not your friend. Your friends will be the one like the Lord said. Remember the Lord said, who is my mother and my brother and my sisters? Those that know the will of God and do it. In other words, Jesus said, the people that are actually my family, as opposed to my relatives, are the people that are about the same thing that I'm about. And how do we know that's true? Well, James got killed early on. James got killed with the sword. But Peter and John, after Pentecost, after Jesus left, Peter and John started walking around doing the same thing that Jesus did, preaching, healing sick people, pulling lame people up off the ground, testifying to the kingdom of God. They started doing the same stuff that Jesus did. That's how you know that they were friends. That's how you know they were on the same page with Jesus because they honored the Lord even after he ascended back into heaven by carrying on his work. And that's how you know Judas was not because he was willing to sell Jesus out because Jesus wasn't doing it the way he thought he should do it, as fast as, as he thought he should do it, that kind of thing. Don't let anybody, and I mean anybody in your life, stop you from getting this level up blessing from God. And all the people that get angry and jealous and resentful, let them be angry and let them go. Let them get gone away with that because you don't need that negativity. Remember, if you keep feeding yourself, Negativity that gets in your spirit. You don't. You most certainly do not need to be confessing. You need to be using the power of your mouth to say the same thing God is saying. Because when you do that, you establish what God is saying on the earth realm. A lot of people don't understand that. That's why there's a Bible, because we have dominion over the earth realm. When God made us in His image, the first thing He said was, "Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion." The reason being because you can't be like God without a kingdom to rule. So when God made the earth realm and set it all up, he gave it to us. This is our kingdom to rule, but he meant for us to rule it in concert with him. He meant for us to rule it in fellowship with him. He never meant for us to separate from him, but this is our kingdom. That's why as goes man, so goes the earth. So what God meant to happen was that we would act like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost did. So that's why the word had to be spoken in the earth realm. That's why we have a Bible. So remember that prayer that the Lord told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why. So we can take the same stuff that God says and we can release it here in our realm and our kingdom and we can have a reflection of what it looks like in heaven right here on earth. Some of y'all been going to church your whole life. Nobody ever explained that to you. That's why we have scripture. So we can say what he says. So we can create that on earth because this is our kingdom. That's right. So I'm saying all that to say, that's why you can't let anybody talk you out of your blessing. Do not let that negativity get in your head. Do not let that, ne let that negativity come out your mouth. Don't let it take you backwards where somebody's trying to keep you tripping on what was when God has opened his hand and showed you what could be. Good God Almighty. I'm going to listen to this myself. Just blessing my heart. Okay? So that's a prophetic word for today that for some, an opportunity is going to come to level up. Don't miss it. Don't reject it. Don't let anybody take it from you. And all the mother mistakes I talked about, don't do any of that. But do like King Solomon. Grab that moment. Do like Michael Jackson did when he did Billie Jean on Motown 25. Grab that moment. Kill it. Crush it. Own it. Because it's going to take your life all the way up. Amen and amen. All right. That's prophetic word for today. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me live. Thank you uh, so much to those of you that are watching this on the replay. Thank you so much to those of you that are <clears throat> watching this on YouTube. This video is going to premiere on YouTube in about an hour or less. So you can watch the replay uh, on Facebook. You can watch it on Insta because I'm going to download it to my IGTV. But you can also watch it on YouTube. Okay. Now, you know, I don't do what I do for money. But if you want to bless uh, my ministry financially, I put my Zelle in the Facebook chat, so go there. 
And uh, so I thank you so much. And uh, like I said, I'm absorbing this word. The word comes to me just like it comes through me. So I'm praising God for what he's saying. And 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 I want to move forward. All right. So that's it for this Sunday. I will be here next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Uh, if you came on late, go back to the top of this message and watch it from the top so you can get all the principles. All right. Amen. And God bless. And remember, remember, God has extended his hand and it's time to level up. God bless.